Let's see if yep. we can hear us. Let me just but, but, um, the of... Yeah, so so it's it's uh Mario is here, which is great. Congratulations, Mario! You just passed your S two, is it? Oh no no no! I just get my solo for the S <laughs> two. Oh, well that's done. still good. That's still good. Oh uh, yeah, that, look, it, it was a massive difference in between um, different. Um, um, oh shit! I forgot the word. Mentors. Sure. I don't know why I get more nervous with ones than with others. Fair. Yeah. Well, some people. Yeah. Maybe some of them don't aren't that nice. And um, yeah, some of the other ones are like you said before with the pilots, experienced ADC, you know, like real world controllers. And one thing is that you can behave yourself like you know many things, but you know, don't, 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 if you use it too much or if you pass a threshold, you know, you, you convert into a fucking moron. Sorry about the language. <laughs> But yeah. you know, it, it it flips completely away. Aye. And yeah, with the latest two controllers that I have been just doing my my tutoring and stuff, yeah, it went perfectly fine. And yeah, in two sessions, I just passed everything. So yeah, I'm happy. Fantastic. That's really. Good. I also passed my forklift test. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Today, so yeah. Always way to drive a forklift. Sounds fun. My no, uh, you need cousin to works people. offshore and he drives them and he sent me a video of him oh. doing donuts in one. Who's this? <laughs> yeah. You can put oh, it on three wheels. I just tested it. <laughs> that's amazing. Then a tackle no. flower just came off and I say, okay, Mario, let's stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you look at the guys that were working there, they were like machines, you know. They, they didn't. They don't even stop the machine, they just put it into reverse and while it's just starting to to enter into reverse, they're picking up the pallet, you know, and the box and they're just going backwards with the box and it's like just uh, what? <laughs> well at least it's done now, isn't it? Oh okay. yeah. Um yeah, so right, Andrew you're gonna you're gonna be sharing it, yeah? Yeah, I've I've decided just to stick with the old slides because I don't have enough time to Right, yeah, no worries. We do them so we can just kind of gloss over some stuff and take liberties if it's going too, too in depth. Aye, no worries. So let me go ahead and. How many are we expecting? So that's a great question. Um, Three. So we're, we're expecting at least. Uh, so it'll be Mario, it'll be a, one of my clients is coming uh null is gonna be late there are two people who responded in the aviate server but i don't know if that means they'll come or not oh david responds to every event he does oh. <laughs> yeah. ah ojeba bonsoir how are you doing bonsoir 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 hello everybody hello, hello. <laughs> what is the language here uh, english wow. it is english perfect yeah. okay Eng english and party french ah, okay so <laughs> Both are fine for me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I've been ruining Tarek's days with hey, 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 attempts for years now. It's up here, finally. Ah, we got, yeah, fantastic, David. So, I think Manny said he'd come as well, but I don't know if he's going to be on time or not. Or if he's going to oh, go. Let me just test him. Anybody from outside uh, AVA? Because this is put on by somebody, by yourself there, Mary. Yes, so Puff Mac is not an aviate. We've got Ojeba, who's not an aviate. Mm -hmm. um, one of my clients, he's going to show up, I think, at some point. And someone else from outside aviate is going to come in, but only halfway through. He told me about it ahead of time. So I think what we can do, we can chat for a couple more minutes, see if Manny shows up out and, and uh, Ravi shows up, but then we can go. Um, I don't know whether Maddie's working there. Aye, fair enough. Uh, in that case, just a couple more minutes. Um, and it's, it's uh, yeah, 8 p.m. in the UK there and 9 in Europe. It's only 3 o'clock in the afternoon here in North America. Yeah, yeah, it's 8 p.m. here, yeah. Um, I think we've got, we've got how many people in Europe itself? Two here so far. 
Yeah. Yeah, uh, well, Puffmack, I'll, I'll give you the floor, mate. This is all yours. Yeah, that's cool. But we just wait till five past. See if anybody else joins. Yeah, absolutely. Two minutes of banter. Yeah, some are. <laughs> let's, let's look at uh, ATR, CBT stuff. I know. So first things first. Well, then let's say congratulations to a few people. First off, congratulations to uh, to Puff Mac for for securing his position as a first officer on the ATR seventy two. Ooh! Yay! Congrats! Yeah, nice. Yeah, thanks very much. Tarek's uh, Tarek's success. <laughs> Where did you fly in that ATR, mate? Uh, Scotland, Logan Air. Ooh, sweet! If you know them. Yep. ATR 75s and 76s, yes. Yeah, so start next week. Which I was just talking to uh, Maryface there. I've got the type rating coming up, and we've got, they sent us an email yesterday saying we had 45 modules of computer based training to complete between now and Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, it turned out to be a mistake. <laughs> Yeah, maybe it's 4.5 models, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I prefer to be a regional pilot, just stretch the legs more often. <laughs> yeah, and then, it'll be uh, fun. And then uh, congrats to, to Mario for, um, for, pa for passing his S2 solo and his forklift license, which sounds amazing. <laughs> Yay, Absolutely sounds like right. 500 euros more a month. <laughs> oh, that's amazing, that's a significant amount. No donuts. A free no time donuts. in the afternoon. No donuts. <laughs> oh well, at least when the boss is not around. But we have been racing then. <laughs> I see Ravi's here as well, thanks for joining us Ravi. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I, th I think... <laughs> Good. Uh, so Ravi, we've, got, we've got Puff Mac, who's the instructor today. We've got Mario, uh, David, and David, who are from another flight simulator community. And uh, we've got Ojeba, which is from a third flight simulator community. I think that's everyone for now, um, Puff Mac. So if you want to start. Yeah, it looks good. Over. I'm happy. Uh, so, first, just to like, do a bit of introduction <laughs> so that we can all kind of gauge the experience levels in the room. Uh, so we'll just go through, I suppose, in order that we're sitting in Discord here. So um, Puff Mac, you could call me Andrew or Andy. Uh, I've been a private pilot for the past five years. I just recently turned commercial. Uh, I've got about 250 hours, and virtually all of that time has been navigating uh, using the VFR techniques, which I'm going to try and teach you tonight. Uh, recently, I've completed my instrument rating. And as uh, Tarek just said there, I've got my first job as a first officer. So this will probably start to fade into obscurity for me for a while. So it's probably good to be doing it now while it's still fresh. Um, but that's that's about it. Oh, and Tarek taught me to fly. Yeah, always have to include that in there. He was my uh, PPL instructor. So everything I'm telling you, if it's wrong, blame, blame Tarek. Blame <laughs> <laughs> Tarek. <laughs> Okay, uh, so Dasborn, do I give a quick intro? If you're here, that'll be David. David, it's me. Hello, yes. yes. Do I give a yeah, quick intro? Good. Just so we all know each other. Uh, David Bourne, uh, member of Aviate since the beginning. Um, I'm based in Canada, just about an hour east or west of Toronto. I'm a PPL myself. I have about 200 plus hours in the 172, and uh, just bearing down for another snowstorm here this evening. How is that one? Is that bad yet? The snow. Well, if you have the roof <laughs> fixed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, excellent. Who's next? Uh, Getrav. Hey, I'm uh, learning with Tariq. And I'm I'm starting my flight training with the simulator first, and Great. then uh, move on to private pilot training. Excellent. After doing other things uh, in a simulator, so I have more knowledge when I go in. How uh, how fast through are you doing the virtual PPL course with Tarek? Yep. Excellent. How fast through are you? Um, we just started maybe four or five lessons. Right. Okay. 
Okay, good. So this will be interesting because this will be quite uh, advanced stuff you'll start to move on to later on. So you'll have yeah, a head I've been studying VOR and uh, all the navigation uh, using the four flight kind of application and trying to learn all the different things in, on how to do the navigation. So this class will be really good for me. Good. Excellent. Thank you, Mario. And me, Mario, uh, have been in bad scene since September of 2011. And the experience, I just improvised everything and learned it the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> I joined the bad sim special ops team about a year ago, something like that. No, not a year ago, nine months ago. And yeah, they instructed me like, just that a little bit about BFR, but I still struggle with some parts, you know, like how to penetrate into some airspaces, top levels, and yep, things like that. And okay. also how to how to plan a, a BFR flight plan. When, for example, in our special ops team, they require you to be on a target on time. And I really don't know what tool can I use for that, except from just measuring the distances to the calcs with the airspeed that I'm going to travel and just write down everything on a paper, which is kind of a mess. Oh, hopefully we can uh, give you some tools and techniques to to do that a bit more effectively in the lesson. Uh, thank you, Tarek. I presume everybody here knows you, but I suppose we'll meet as well. Yeah, I think most of you know me. Uh, I'm Tarek. You can call me Mary Mary Face or Tarek. And I I taught Andrew. I was, so I was a flight instructor. I did some survey flying, some airline flying. Uh, and I'm going back into the commercial aviation world as a commercial as a private jet pilot soon. Uh, and uh, I teach online, as some of you know. A uh, big passion of mine. And um, I'm here to support Andrew, but honestly, like this, the presentation Andrew has here is better than anything I could do. So I'm not worried at all. Um, but uh, we created ANC because we're just we just love flying, we love flight simulation, and and we want to share that passion. So that's why I'm here today. Thank you. No. I see oh, you yeah. managed to join us. I well, spoke know. to I you for a long time. It's been a minute. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you for doing this. This is so exciting. Uh, I'm Noel. I'm based in the Americas. I am an, an interested party, but I have yet to get up in a real boy plane. I've just been flying in VATSIM, which I do a couple times a week, and I love learning about navigation. Nice. Excellent. This will be That's round two, Noel. This is the, uh, I think you were at the last presentation we've done of this. So that the to see how fresh it is. Could always use a refresher, man. Could always yeah. use a refresher. There you go. Picked up some new tips and tricks along the way. So let's just see. Thank you. And Ojeba. Yeah, so yeah, guys, thanks for having having us here and for this presentation. Uh, yeah, I met uh, Mary Face on, uh, on another flight sim community a while ago. Uh, and uh, I'm based in Belgium, and I'm doing at the moment uh, an ultralight uh, pilot course. And I'm uh, at about 20 hours uh, going from now. <laughs> and we're just about to start uh, navigation, so this comes right on time. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Right. Okay, cool. With that, then I suppose we'll crack on. Can you all see my screen? I'm sharing it on Discord. Yes. Yes, okay, firm. perfect. Okay, so there's quite a bit to this. Uh, some of you guys have got experience, most of you don't. So I do apologise if I go over some of the principles uh, in a bit of depth that maybe the, the guys with the experience have been through. Just bear with me. Uh, I'll try not to take too long on it. It really is just for awareness. Uh, but what we're going to go through today is different ways of navigating. Uh, the principles of a thing called dead reckoning. The differences between some technical terms, heading versus track, magnetic versus true headings, wind components, we'll talk all about them and what they are and how we can use them. The difference between airspeed and ground speed, uh, how we compensate for the wind in our navigational calculations, 
We'll talk a bit about fuel and time management, both from a practical and a legal point of view. And then we'll have a look at planning a flight. We'll have a look at using the, uh, the, the principles of dead reckoning in a flight and how we correct for errors that we encounter in the air. Uh, the purpose of this is to learn, but also have a bit of fun. Um, some concepts go into more detail than you need for flight sim, but with the ever-evolving Microsoft Flight Simulator, to be honest, it's, uh, it's all quite relevant, I would say, at this point. Um, let me know what you want to do with brakes as we go. I don't know if there's any natural points uh, of breakage as we, as we go through this, but... You know, maybe an hour into it, we can we can take a a short break just to let everyone sort of relax a bit. Should take about two hours to go through. And if you've got any questions, please just shout them out as they come into your head. I, I want to try and keep this dynamic. I don't want to lecture, uh, if at all possible. And most importantly, if I'm boring you, please tell me because the intention is not to just bore you here. It's to it's to teach you, it's to get you thinking. Okay. Nah, you can bore nobody with that particular accent, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Glad you could understand me. You're all passing the first test. So, very, very basic then. What is the purpose of navigation? It's a bit of a weird question. Does anybody want to have a go at answering it? What do you think? Off the top of your head, is the purpose of navigation? Get yourself from the point A to B. Yeah, pretty much. That's the gist of it. It's uh, the process of monitoring and controlling the movement of a craft from one place to another. That's a very worthy way of saying getting from A to B. So, while we're doing that, we've got to avoid obstacles, terrain and the weather. We've got to account for airspace as well. And we've also got to give consideration to aircraft performance and endurance. There's no point in planning a flight that you, your aircraft can't actually do. Uh, as an example, you've got a, a hill in the way, a big hill, 10,000 feet hill, and your aircraft can only go to 9,000 feet. You can't go over that hill. You're going to have to go around it, even if the weather's perfect. Okay, so things like that have to be considered. Look at this lovely panel. I'd love to fly something like that. So. Can anybody name any methods of navigating that they're aware of and flying, or in general? You said earlier, dead reckoning. There's one. Perfect. Anything else anybody can think of? Different ways we can navigate? By time and heading, maybe? Yeah, yeah, so that that's part of dead reckoning. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah what about dead visual, reckoning? Yeah, and what about, what do you do? A lot of you guys mentioned VORs. back them. VORs, yeah, okay, perfect. So radio navigation is the, the primary means of navigating for anybody doing any kind of serious flying. Um, it's it's taken over, you know, with the advent of satellite navigation, GPS, GLONASS, Galileo. Uh, these, these radio navigation uh, systems really have become very, very accurate. Uh, we could also use unconventional navigation, which for any of the PPLs, you probably do this quite a bit now. You take off from your local airfield, you're going somewhere that you know, so you don't really have to look at the chart, you don't plan it, you might just take the chart along and look at it as a reference just so that you can make sure you're on the right track. Uh, but generally speaking, you're you're just looking out the window and sort of navigating along using features. We call that feature crawling as well sometimes. Ravi did mention oh. feature crawling, by the way. I think his volume was a bit low. Ah, okay. Okay. Excellent. Good shout. It is a very valid way of navigating. Uh, I use it all the time. I love it. Uh, but what we are going to talk about today is dead reckoning. Now, dead reckoning is, and I believe that is the correct spelling before anybody picks me up on it. It's been corrupted. Uh, and people drop the A, but I believe it's dead reckoning. Probably completely wrong. For the Americans, you may know a process called pilotage. David, does that sound familiar to you? David's Canadian, by the way. Yeah, that sounds correct. North American people. 
it's not in just the, American. It's in the FARA and they talk about it. Yeah, okay. So pilotage is a similar concept uh, to dead reckoning, but I believe it's taught slightly different in the States. So what we're going to be looking at today is more of a European approach, but you know, the world round it works no matter where you are. Uh, everybody does things their own way, so don't don't get too caught up with it. Okay, so dead reckoning, what is this thing that I keep talking about? So does anybody know before I go giving the answer away? Some of you sound like you might have a an idea. Nope. Nope. Okay. Nope. Some people have heard of first, it. First time that I heard that principle. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. So dead reckoning is the process of calculating the current position of some moving object by using a previously determined position. You can tell I've been all over Wikipedia when I wrote this, can't you? I've not looked at this in a year. So what does that really, how does that work? Well, what we do is we identify turning points on the chart. We plot track lines between them. We measure the distance and we estimate the time required to fly those legs, okay? In flight, the actual position is estimated at regular intervals and compared against the planned position and the heading corrections are calculated and applied if required. So if you're in the correct place, you don't really need to do anything. If you're not quite in the right place, which is more common than not, you would determine your current position based on what you can see around you and then you would use the chart and a bit of quick mental maths to work out the correction that you have to apply in order to get where you want to go. Now, that all sounds very old fashioned, but inertial navigation systems uh, or inertial reference systems, as is more commonly fitted on modern airliners, use this exact principle uh, to this day. So people think when you fly north over the North Atlantic, uh, you've got radar coverage and air traffic controllers know where you are. They, they really don't. Uh, it's, it's all working on dead reckoning. Now, nowadays, with uh, the likes of GPS, that's sort of superseded dead reckoning. But the IRS is continuously calculating its position based on a known start point and then calculating the position based on the accelerations it experiences throughout the flight. And the modern IRS systems are so accurate uh, that even after a full day's flying, uh, having only been aligned in the morning, they're still, you know, within the region of a half a mile of, uh, you know, the, the, the correct location. So it's, the principles are very valid. When a computer uses it, it can be very, very accurate. But when it's a human applying these principles, it's a bit less accurate. But in the grand scheme of things, it's still, still, quite, uh, still quite good. And this in the left here is an example of a typical plot that I might do. This was a real flight I actually flew. So this was a, where you can see I've got, I've gone from different places, Bayliston up to Stirling. I've got the, the heading, or sorry, the track 199. I've got the distance 16 miles. And I've got some other stuff, which we'll talk about. You know, you can see that on these legs here. So we'll use this, we'll come back to this uh, particular venture of mine in, in future. Okay, so the tracks and the distances are transferred from the chart. We measure them on the chart, we mark them up on the chart, but then we transfer them to what we call a log, okay? Uh, a pilot log. And that's just uh, an organized list of each of your turning points and the, the information, metadata, I suppose you could call it, that we need to know about those turning points. Okay, so as an example, uh, we are looking for things like ground speed, distance, estimated time on route, the heading to steer, which is calculated based on the predicted winds. And the plug is used in flight to monitor progress and record any deviations. So the way we use it is the plug is the primary tool and the chart we use uh, as a reference every so often uh, when we check our position. So we're not flying along staring at the chart. We're really, we've put all the information we need on the plug. The plug's on your knee board, so it's in front of you, and the chart will be put away until you need it, and you only check it every so often. 
Okay. So, is there any questions around the principles of uh, dead reckoning as we've covered them so far, or anything I've said that's perhaps confusing anybody? Nope. Oh, Excellent. Clear. Excellent. Okay, cool. If you do think of anything as we go, just shout, please. So, what is the difference between heading and track? There's a lovely diagram on the right which has given away the question, or the answer, I should say. But who wants to give it a bash? Who can yeah, tell me? When you go, Mario? I do, for example, the heading, did you can just ask the preferably. As the big dude preferably just explains, you know, you can get deviated by the wind component, you know, for example, you know, you... okay, so how would you describe heading, you know, it just changes in in different parts of the world, you know, if you go up north, you get more deviation, if you stay back in the middle part of the air, you get like perfect alignment. Okay, so these are all really valid things, I would actually talk about them, but if you were to just describe what is the heading? Uh, as a technical description, Dull, have you got an idea? Oh, well, you said technical. I have, a, I, have a, I have the dumb way I remember it is. It's yeah, I like uh, dumb ways as well. Go for it. I love them. The the heading is the way my nose is pointed. The track is the way I'm going. Perfect. Yeah, that's right. Mm. The heading is the direction that you're pointing, but the track is the direction in which the airplane travels. So someone mentioned wind, Mario, uh, and you can see it in this diagram here. The uh, the nose is pointing sort of northeast, but the wind's coming from the northwest. So the aircraft is actually going to travel on a track slightly east of the heading. If you don't if you don't correct for it, you and you point the nose at where you want to go, you'll drift away. And we'll talk about that principle as well. Is that quite straightforward? Does that make sense? Good. We'll go. We'll do some examples anyway. So heading and track are not always the same on that basis. Track is equivalent to the compass bearing which you would follow if you were to move from A to B across the ground. In a nil wind situation, the heading will be equal to the track, but when you have wind, the difference between heading and track is the drift angle. In real life, due to winds aloft, Heading and track are often different, not always by a lot, but there's generally a difference, uh, especially in lighter aircraft. The slower you go, the more it affects you. The faster you go, the, the less of a difference it makes. So let's uh, let's say we're planning a flight and we're going from uh, Mariotopia to Null Town. And that's on a nice, we've looked at the chart and we've measured it and it's a lovely track of zero nine zero okay so we take off in our little aircraft and we point the nose zero nine zero luckily for us there's no wind so do you think we'll get to null town i apologize for picking on you guys i just seen your names and it was easy to make a name up on <laughs> no worries so with no wind i think that we can make it perfectly uh... yeah so with no wind, if we point at Null Town on a heading of 090, we will track 090 and we will, of course, arrive overhead. So let's see, we think, great, we've done that before, let's do it again. It's the next day, we take off, we point the nose 090, but this time we've got some wind. What do you think is going to happen? We're going to drift we to the left, right? Yes. Correct. So we're going to track 087, even though we're pointing the head at 090. So that's that's because of the wind components, which we'll look at. Okay. Uh, so if we wanted to track 090, we'd have to turn into the wind by a few a few degrees. I can't remember if I calculated this. That, that, that sounds about right. So we would turn right by a heading of uh, or by a, an amount of three degrees into the wind, and that would compensate. It's a very light wind, five knots. Okay, so the faster the wind is, the more effect it has. But the faster the aircraft goes, the less effect the wind has in general. 
and we we have to then compensate for the wind. Is that concept pretty straightforward? That we use aware of that. Yes. Okay. Even if you weren't, you probably do it. A good example is when you're landing, and a crosswind. You, without calculating or thinking about it, you adjust the heading so the aircraft tracks towards the runway. Uh, with uh, accounting for the wind, you don't pull a calculator out. You don't calculate it. You don't work anything out in advance. You just do it by feel and looking out the window and seeing if the runway moves in the windscreen. Uh, but that is the exact same principle. So a lot of time people don't know the terms, but they, they, they do know the physical principle of it. Okay, cool. So next, first principle, magnetic versus true. What's the difference? Someone tell me. In relation to a heading. Is magnetic north at the true north pole? No. No, it is not, correct. Is it always moving? No. Oh, it is. It moves yes. a lot. Yeah, it moves a lot. <laughs> is it going to swap places yeah. with the South Pole in the next few thousand years? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> How will that affect aviation? Who knows? It's quite scary. <laughs> Let's hope we are not here by the time that happens. So, the compass as a magnetic instrument, it senses the Earth's magnetic field. It does not know or care where the North and South Poles are. So, as such, the heading on the compass is relative to magnetic North, not true North. The difference between magnetic North and true North is known as variation. And variation varies throughout the world, throughout countries, throughout towns, a couple of miles across from each other. Uh, but reasons that I don't really know, but you just need to know the pilot it does. Uh, it's on your charts. I might have a, a slide where I can show you, but the, the lines on the charts are called isogonals, and isogonals connect areas on a chart of equal variation. So they usually run kind of north to south-ish, although they've quite often got a bit of a a cant to them, so they're more sort of southwest to northeast. Um, and as a pilot, all you have to do is look at the chart and the general area you're flying and see what's variation. And you can then account for that because what you're plotting on the chart will be true. And that's important to remember uh, because if you just transfer all of your true tracks into your calculations and calculate what your headings need to be to fly an aircraft and you've got a variation of say 10 or 15 degrees which happens especially in the likes of Canada the closer you get to the poles the more volatile it gets um, you're in for a bad day and you're going to end up going the wrong way more than likely so you do need to be aware of the difference between magnetic and true and the isogonal will show you that has anybody seen these? Is anybody aware of them? Has anybody ever heard of them? Never, ever. Okay. At well, least for me. Yeah. In North America, of course, it's quite varied between East and West. So it's, uh, you do get a quite into them, especially if you're not just doing local VFR flights, and but if you're doing a more long distance flight, then yes, you'll get into magnetic yeah. variation. And I think if I'm right, David, when you start to go into the sort of northern reaches of Canada, you get the runways actually start to get marked in true because the uh, the magnetic variation is so severe and so variable as well, it changes quite quite a lot. Yeah, the bars actually converge. So, And then the way I was always taught about the difference between true and magnetic is, um, you know, if you're flying and so you read it, it's true. If you hear it, it's magnetic. Yeah. That's good. We uh, there's a saying in the UK: the Met Man is always right, or the Met Man's always true, uh, because when they report the weather, when they report whatever the Met Met Office man, the Met Man tells you, it will always be in true headings, true bearings. Uh, so you've got to convert to magnetic if you're if you're listening to a weather broadcast. So. Yeah, I suppose it depends on the world where you are, but you've got to be careful. You've got to be aware. Where, what is it? Is it true or magnetic that you're that you're working with? And then what do you need? Usually on an aircraft, you need magnetic. If you're plotting something on a chart, you would have to convert back to true. 
Right, but it's a simple calculation and there's an easy way to do it and I'll, I'll go over that. There's one last thing to consider in the way of compasses. Has anybody got an idea of what that is? There's a very big clue on the screen. That's a... Swing. Yes. Deviation. Swing. So, aircraft are, generally speaking, made out of metal. Apart, the newer ones are, are uh, less so. They're going to composite materials. But even uh, you know non-magnetic or non-ferrous metals have a degree of magnetism, a degree of uh, impact on the compass. So the more of the stuff you have, the more the more volatile, the more the more of an impact it has. And also, modern aircraft are full of electronics, and all of these things have mm. a bearing on the compass. I see someone's just joined us. Hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for joining us. We're not too far in. Um, you've not missed too much. We've just covered uh, we've covered track and heading. We've covered wind drift, and we're just looking at compasses now. I'll I'll no catch problem. up in the home and in private messages. Yeah, sure. So, if you fly ahead on the compass, you're flying what we call a magnetic heading. The compass is affected by th other magnetic sources such as the airframe, avionics and other factors. And the difference between what's indicated and the direction uh, that the, the actual magnetic heading is known as deviation. Compasses are calibrated, they're swung, as someone mentioned, uh, using and there's a deviation card placed in the cockpit. Not always on the compass, but usually somewhere quite obvious. And the deviation card tells the pilot uh, for a given heading what they need to show on the compass. Okay, so modern aircraft tend not to have much of an issue with uh, compass deviation. Older aircraft with you know older equipment, um, maybe a slightly leaky compass, can quite have some quite severe deviation. Sometimes up to five degrees or so. Um, so it is worth paying attention when you're in your aircraft to these cards. So this aircraft in particular seems to be pretty good. So you probably just wouldn't connect your heading, to be honest with this. You know, it's within a degree. Some of them are bang on, some of them are exact. But you can see it gives you in 30 degree in, uh, increments. You know, for for north, you should fly minus one. So you should fly 359 to fly north. Okay, you're not going to get that level of precision. This uh, instrument's not even got enough graduations on the scale to allow you to perform to that level of uh, precision. So, you know, this aircraft wouldn't be a problem, but again, something to be aware of. Flight sim, I don't think it's a it's an issue, but in real aircraft, that is something to pay attention to. And it's specific to each aircraft. That makes sense. Any questions so far? No. Just, Good. just a curiosity. Is on the older planes, the more drift that the, that the compass has is because of the airframe or is because of the degradation of the compass? It, it can be, it, it can be the, the airframe. Yeah, there could be a, a noisy magnetic source that's affecting the compass. Uh, the airframe might be, the older airframes in particular have a lot more metal in them. So they're just, anything metal will affect the magnetic field. You can get induced currents in the metal itself, so that then causes a magnetic field. You know, so any of these things can, can cause it. Um, That's curious. <laughs> yeah, so it's an interesting phenomenon. It is. It can be adjusted when they swing the compass. There's some. There's an uh, an adjustment nut on the the compass that the engineers can actually try and get it closer to the desired heading. So if it compasses wildly out, you know, they can try and fix it, but it's, you know, it's never going to be exact. There's always going to be a small amount of deviation. The other big cause of it is, uh, as I say, a leaky compass. If, if, the, if the fluid is leaking out of the compass, the actual magnet itself won't float correctly and can get stuck in the housing and can cause a lot of issues. I've uh, experienced that a couple of times. Thankfully, I was... PMC, so it wasn't too much of an issue, but uh, yeah, malfunctioning compasses do happen, although they're very simple, they, they can they can start to fail. 
<laughs> nice. Yeah, not so nice when it happens, but... <laughs> not good when it drips all over you. Not at all. Horrible oily stuff. I think it's mineral oil that's in these things. Okay, so how do we convert between magnetic and true? Does anybody know? Does any of the pilots here have a way of doing this? We have to add or subtract the the variation. Yes, yes, you do. And do you know, did you get taught a particular way to do it, David? Was there a, a mnemonic or anything you were taught? So it's, I'm aware of what I'm about to teach is probably very British, so there's a few. But yeah. uh, some uh, Some guy a little while ago taught me about this great mnemonic called Cadet, which I use constantly. Cadet, yes, Cadet's great. And uh, there's another it. one at a higher level. Cadbury's Dairy Milk makes very tasty treat. <laughs> a sailor taught me it in the other order, which I don't use because it's more confusing. But this, in, in the sailing world, they do the same thing. And they uh, they remember it as true virgins make dull company. So take that for <laughs> what you will. DDMVT, Cadbury's Dairy Milk makes very tasty treat. We'll go with the politically correct version. So let's take an example. Uh, we've got, we've plotted a track on the map, we've measured it, it's 219 on the map or the chart, and we've looked at the isogonal, and the isogonal says the variation in this, uh, this particular part of the world is 2, two west. So to go from true to magnetic, do we add or do we subtract? No, no punishment if you get it wrong. I'm just curious to see how you might think. 50, okay, 50. Nobody, knows. nobody knows. Okay, let's, let's <laughs> let's do it try it. On. I'll I'll take a crack if no one if no one's going to do it. Uh, uh, if if we're going true to compass, and we have a two degree west variation, we would uh, add the west, correct? Yeah. Yes, you would. So. There's a couple of ways to remember this. They always, in uh, ground school, used to say, east is least, west is best. They all thought this was great. Never ever sunk in with me for some reason. So I was taught cadet by a sailor, actually. They never taught me this one in, uh, in flight school. So they are worthwhile talking to every now and then, sailors, although they're very weird people. Apologies if anyone's a sailor. So cadet is a mnemonic. Well, it's not really a mnemonic. It's just a a word to remember the order of it. So compass to true. So that is, if you're going compass to true, then you add east. So if you remember that, cadet, write it out, compass to true, add east. Uh, you can then figure out the rest. So if you're going compass to true, you would add east and subtract west. If you're going true to compass, you would do the opposite. You would add west and subtract east. So that's quite a good one. I used that for a while. Well, look, I didn't even need to use my laser point. I'd already done this. However, the way that I was taught most recently, which I thought was just far simpler, and this is why it's important to use CDMVT, not uh, TM, TVM, DC, True Virgins Make Dull Company, it's important to do it in the right order because if you do it as CDMVT, you can draw an arrow in the direction of either east or west, and the arrow always points to the bigger number. So in that case, forget east is least, west is best, forget cadet. All you really have to do is write CDMVT, put down your true heading, put down your variation, and then draw an arrow. So in this case, west, so conventionally, west is to the left. So the, the arrow points to the biggest number, so we need to add two. Okay, makes sense? Yep. Good. Okay. So let's say we look, we've made this magnetic heading 221, and we look at the deviation card on the compass. Remember that thing we talked about? And the deviation says it's one east. So how would we apply that? What would that make? The compass heading that we need to steer. If we want to fly a magnetic heading of 221 and the deviation of the compass is 1 east, 
we can use the exact same way that we just done there if anyone wants to give it a bash. Go on, Mario, you've piped up. It's your moment. Uh... What would you do for No, but on the CDM VT, it's just, uh, I don't know how to calculate it. But with the K that thinks, just this. <laughs> or is this least, what's this best? Yeah, whatever works. Yeah. I like the arrows. So, first thing I would do is draw an arrow. So, the arrow points to the east. The arrow points to the bigger number. The bigger number is 221. That means we need to subtract 1. And I don't know how I come up with that. Oh, because... okay, Roger. Yeah, but the principle's yeah, right, the number's scale. wrong. Yeah. I never checked, how dare I? Hopefully the next examples are more correct. So it would be less than, it wouldn't be 218, it would be 220. I've obviously changed the numbers here without uh, double checking, so I apologise for that. So let's look at another example. So this is quite, this must be in Canada or Russia. We've got quite a, a hefty variation here. So we've measured the track as 045. The variation is 13 degrees east. What's the magnetic heading? Who wants to who wants to give it a bash? What way does the arrow point? To the right. East. To the right. East. Correct. Yep. So then what's the bigger number? Magnetic or true? True. So then what would the magnetic heading be in this Beneath particular instance? 032. 032, well done. See, dead simple. Deviations to west. So what is the compass uh, heading that we need to steer? What way does the arrow go? To the left. To the... the arrow points to the bigger number. What's the compass heading or the yeah the compass heading that we need to steer then for a magnetic 032 let's hope this one's right when it pops up it's 034 bang on just like that you can see there how using the the variation from the chart and the deviation on the compass card we can calculate we can convert between a true track heading or sorry a true track that we've measured on the chart to a compass heading that we can fly in the aircraft to follow that track. Yeah? Do you, do you, does everybody understand the purpose of this uh, process? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Great. If anybody doesn't, if we continue on and they don't, they're not sure, uh, please just let me know and I'll, I'll go over it again. I should have also probably said CDMVT, apart from meaning Cadbury, Cadbury's dairy milk makes very tasty treats. Uh, actually stands for Compass Deviation Magnetic Heading Variation True. Okay. So there's another example there. 19 East. You can see we're going round through north in this particular instance. 3 East on the deviation means that we've got to, to fly 348. Now, crucially, this is correcting for magnetic variation and deviation. Uh, it doesn't this isn't us correcting for wind yet, but it's important that uh, we correct for the compass uh, variations when we do calculate the wind uh, corrections. Otherwise, they, they, they won't be of any use to us. If we're not, if we calculate a heading to fly, uh, but we've not accounted for magnetic variation and deviation, if you fly that heading in the aircraft, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work because you're not actually pointing the right direction in the first place. You're failing the first hurdle. So this section's quite windy, quite uh, quite long-winded, so I'm not going to go over it all in as much detail as I did last time, but very, very briefly, there's a number of airspeeds uh, that aircraft use, uh, but for what we want to do, we're only really interested in two of them. So there's indicated airspeed, which is what you actually see in front of you on the, the instrument. Calibrated airspeed is corrected uh, for things called instrument error and position error. So the instrument may have some mechanical uh, backlash in it, so it's not quite pointing at the exactly correct position. 
and also the where the, the pitots are on the aircraft may be subject to some error because of the pressure uh, being formed by the air around the airframe. So they may over or under read. Most aircraft, it's not a huge difference to try and put pitot tubes uh, in a position that's least affected by aerodynamic forces. But it's not always the case, and quite often you find with things like gear and flaps deployed where the, where the, uh, the airflow becomes much more messy, you get much more uh, position error on the instrument and you have to be careful. To correct between indicated and calibrated, you would look at a, a lookup table, which is available in the aircraft uh, manual. And you can see here, there's one from a Cessna. And for most configurations, once you're up at you know normal flying speeds, it's within a knot or two, uh, the, the indicated and the calibrated speed. Once you get flaps deployed and you start flying a bit slower, you can see 50, 50 indicated is actually 54 knots uh, calibrated. Okay. It's not something you need to really worry about, it's just for awareness. True airspeed is the true speed of the aircraft moving through the air. Because the air density reduces with altitude, the higher you go, uh, the, the more of a difference there will be between indicated and true airspeed. So for airliners, for an example, flying up near 40,000 feet, they might only be indicating 250 knots, but the true air speed is probably about 560. You know, so there's a significant difference between what's indicated and what's uh, what's actually you know the, the true speed of the aircraft. But indicated air speed, in a crude way, is what the aircraft experiences. The aircraft doesn't care about true, the aircraft doesn't care about calibrated, the aircraft doesn't care about uh, ground speed. The aircraft cares about indicated, that's what it feels, okay? So true is good for us because it, it, it's indicative of your actual performance, how fast you're moving across or through the air, which can be related to how fast you move across the ground. Uh, but in terms of performance, indicated is important. Okay, and that's just summarising what I've said. So ground speed is the horizontal speed of an aircraft relative to the air surface. That's a very wordy way of saying how fast you're moving over the ground. Is everyone aware of the difference between ground speed and air speed? I take silence as yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Ground speed is very important for navigation because ground speed is what essentially determines how far, it, how how uh, long it will take you to fly between two points. What affects ground speed? Do you think? Open question to the forum. Wind. Yeah. Spot on. That's it. Wind. So you can calculate ground speed by an old-fashioned way, which would be to, to measure the time taken to fly between two points uh, of a known distance, and then working that out, speed equals distance over time, so you can just calculate that distance divided by the time taken would give you your speed. Or you can add or subtract the wind component from the true air speed. So if you know the true air speed, and you know the wind component, you can calculate your ground speed. Accurate calculation of time on route is very important uh, for fuel planning among a number of reasons. So accurate calculation of ground speed is imperative. Uh, and if it changes, you want to know about it as well. In EASA, which is the uh, European Safety Air Aircraft Safety Organization, or Aviation Safety Organization, which is our equivalent of the FAA and the uh, the CA up in Canada, we uh, are timed plus or minus three minutes on skills tests. So if we if we arrive three minutes early or three minutes late, if we're out with that six minute window, that would constitute a, a fail of the navigation part of a skills test. So it's not rocket science. It's not you know it's not Swiss watch building, but it is still pretty accurate, especially if you're going a long distance to arrive within three minutes either side of your estimated time. And you can get good at it. You know, if you practice, you can you can uh, 
and you take the correct steps along the way, you can ensure that you will be on time. Okay, cool. Any questions so far? We'll get to some more fun bits shortly, I promise. No, no. there. Good. So wind component, who knows what a wind component is? Yes, uh, um, where the wind's coming. Does, yes. there, does everybody know what vectors are from mathematics, if you think back to school? Yep. So what can you break a vector down into? A wind component is made up of uh, two specific vectors, the crosswind and headwind component. So if you're experiencing wind from any direction, you'll be experiencing these perpendicular forces on your plane. Yes, correct. That's it. So winds are not a scalar property. They're a vector property. They have magnitude and direction. So like as with any vector, look, I've even wrote that, you can break them down into the components. Okay. So the components are, and this is very much dependent on how you're flying into the headwind, uh, sorry, how you're flying into the wind, headwind or tailwind component and the crosswind component. Now when it comes to affecting the aircraft's position and time en route, the, the two components affect you in different ways. So what do you think the crosswind component is affecting? Does it affect your ground speed, the crosswind component? No. No. The crosswind component only affects uh, your track. Does the headwind component affect your track or the tailwind component? No. No, it does not. It only affects your time. So it's important to use the right component for the right calculations. So because headwind, a tailwind and crosswind components are always defined relative to the aircraft, the magnitude of these components will be different for a given wind, uh, depending on the direction of travel. So if that aircraft turned 90 degrees to the right and decided to fly east, the majority of the wind would be the crosswind component and a small amount of it would be headwind component. Okay, the components would be flipped. The wind's not changed, but because you've changed the aircraft direction, the components change. And that's important because you have, for every leg, you have to recalculate your components in order to, to calculate the new time uh, and the new heading correction. It's not going to be the same across all legs of a flight, even if the wind doesn't change. So do you need to adjust every leg? For Every the leg. Next leg or correct. Every leg you have to do the calculations again. Yeah, can, you can can't work for out. or headwinds. Yeah. Yep. So every every leg every single leg of your flight plan, you would uh, have to calculate the components based on the track that you want to fly uh, from scratch. Okay, there's no there's no getting around it. Well, come on to it, don't worry. As long as you understand that the components change based on uh, how the aircraft's flying, the direction of travel. Oh, yeah, I was having a hard time trying to fly manual holds, you know. Oh, <laughs> that's a whole other standard. subject, Mario. <laughs> yeah, when you flip the standard turn, you know, and you drift away, and you're like, oh, no, fucking my, uh, oh, sorry for that, bitch. On my instrument rating skills test, we had to fly an NDB hold manually with one engine failed to so in the <laughs> aircraft, the engine, one of the engines, and as the examiner being a nice person, failed the critical engine, so the, the <laughs> left engine was pulled back to idle, and NDBs, I don't think Microsoft Flight Simulator models it very well, I'm not sure about explaining P3D, but there's a thing called NDB uh, or ADF dip in the real aircraft. Yep. And the needle points towards the low wing, so it's it's some it's some laugh, honestly. It's, it's great. So yeah, holds holds are a whole different ball game. It works on the same principle, but there's some different different uh, techniques around it. Okay, so only the headwind component, tailwind component affects uh, ground speed, and only the crosswind affects drift. We've covered that. Drifting ground speed can be calculated mathematically. 
but in practice we would normally do it using a purpose-built computer or by shorthand rules okay the one in 60 rule or the clock face rule are the main ones that people use okay. applying the wind vector to the intended track will give a heading to steer in flight to counteract the crosswind component actual drift must be checked at regular intervals to ensure that the intended track is being followed and heading must be adjusted accordingly uh, does anybody really want to cover examples of wind components are you are we happy with the concept yeah we're happy with the concept yeah there's, there's a lot of examples here it, it's really just breaking it down with different but examples yeah I, I want to know what's the one to 60 rule one in 60 rule is a fantastic rule uh, it's it's not just an aviation thing but it, it basically is a a quick way to work out angles in your head so the principle is for every one degree of track error if you fly 60 miles you will be one mile off course so you knowing that you can apply that to uh, different different lengths of legs okay but we'll, we'll look at that later on uh, i'm not sure if i cover the clock rule later on can probably cover that here. Uh, the clock rule is a very straightforward rule. It's one I like to use in real life. I use it all the time. It gives you quite an accurate, uh, but also rough and ready number. So basically, if you if you calculate the uh, the difference between your track and the wind direction. So let's say in this case here, 270 was the track. Let's just say, uh, oh, let's say 260 is the track and the wind is at 030. So that is more than 60. So if you, if you apply it, so if you take the difference, okay, so the difference there would be uh, 230. 200, yeah, 200, no, 270. Feel, 170. Feel, free, feel free to use Excalibur, Andrew, if you want to draw it out. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. basically, I think, I'll wait, because I think I've got a good example later on, but you you imagine the difference between the heading and the wind, and then you apply that, so if it's 20 degrees, 20 degrees is a third of the way around a clock face. If you looked at the numbers on a clock, the number 20 would be a third of the way around, so that a third of the wind would be crosswind component if the num if the difference between the track and the wind was 45 degrees 45 is three quarters of the way around the clock face so three quarters of the wind would be a crosswind component okay don't worry about it too much just now we'll come on to it in more detail but that's that's the principle so these are just different examples I'm not going to leave the point too much. I think we did do these all. Ground speed. Uh, I'll do one example here. So we've got a speed, an IAS indicates the speed of 110. We could calibrate that, although nobody ever really does. So that's actually a calibrated speed of uh, 108. The, the true airspeed is 110. Uh, that would be calculated or measured most most glass cockpits now have a true air speed output but if we've got a headwind component of 10 knots the ground speed would be 110 minus 10 so 100 knots so the ground speed is what you'd use in the navigation calculations your indicated air speed is what you'd use to fly the aircraft so you fly using a constant speed um but the ground speed is through a calculation of true air speed minus the headwind component gives you a ground speed of 100 knots. So it's 100 knots you use in your navigation calculations. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Excellent. Any of the not? Is there anything so far that I've said that people aren't sure oh, on? Sorry, yeah, I didn't press the post to talk. Um... Yeah, there's, is there any rule for compensating for altitude? Uh, so the 
true airspeed isn't affected by altitude. If you're trying to convert between indicated and true, you would need to use a, a reference chart. So the aircraft normally has one in the manual where you can convert an indicated or a calibrated airspeed to a true airspeed and it's based on altitude. Yeah, I have seen some that it has like a scale or a rule of thumb on the on the speedometer on the anemometer. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, if you were to do it if you didn't have anything in the cockpit other than uh, an airspeed indicator, uh, you would have to go into the manual, but most GPS systems will give you true airspeed and ground speed. And uh, most glass cockpits will actually output true airspeed somewhere and ground speed as well. Um, so the, the, in the olden days, these were quite difficult to come by in the cockpit. You had to go through a process. You had to go into the books to get your true airspeed. But modern cockpits, either through GPS uh, navigation systems or uh, through glass cockpits, will calculate true speed and ground speed for you and output it. Oh yeah, just by time also is easier to do. Yeah. The, like, what's the, yeah, the, the amount of information. Five minutes. Yeah. The amount of information you get on these glass cockpits is uh, is fantastic for improving situational awareness over the old nostalgic steam gauges. So that's just some more examples. So cut through that. Okay. Excellent. So is everybody happy to keep going? We've been talking for about, well, I've been talking for about an hour. Do you just want to take a short break? Or do no, you want to I'm okay. People quite happy then to keep to continue? Um, I have to go somewhere, so I'm going to hop off for now, but I'll watch the rest on the YouTube. Okay, no problem. All right, thank you. Thanks for coming. Take care, Ali. Right, bye. 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 Ajaba, uh, yeah, it's fine for me also. Yeah, you're happy? Okay. Mm -hmm, I can't yeah. believe it's been an hour already. I, the time's flown by. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like to hear. Right, okay, cool. If everybody's happy and motivated, we'll continue on. So, we've talked about a lot of technical stuff. Now we need to discuss um, a wee bit about fuel and time management. So, generally speaking, your light aircraft has enough fuel for four or five hours of flight. Now, there's a lot of reasons why that wouldn't be the case in real life. The primary limiting factor is usually the pilot's bladder. The pilot usually needs a pee before four or five hours, so we tend to plan technical stops, unless you're lucky enough to have a toilet on board. Uh, aside from that, there are other problems. So... Most light aircraft cannot carry a person in each seat that's fitted and also have fuel, uh, full fuel tanks. This is just the nature of uh, aircraft being built as as lightweight as possible, um, and also you know the the performance limiting factors of the amount of lift the wings can generate. So. Most aircraft, you have a choice. You can either have full payload or you can have full tanks. You can't have both. So Cessna 172s, PA-28s is a good example. Uh, if you fill the tanks, you can generally speak only take three people, including the pilot. So pilot and two passengers. Uh, even even on Diamond day 42s which I've been flying a bit recently during my training, uh, with full tanks, and anti-ice fluid or de-ice fluid uh, you can only carry two passengers and the pilot uh, which is surprising considering the, the performance but that's a structural limit rather than a performance one I would guess so even the TBM 930 yep yep and Tarek I don't know so much I know the likes of the ATRs you know you are more limited with payload shorts, sheds 360s and stuff, but you know, even up at the Airbus A320 Boeing 737 level, does it become a consideration? Yeah, at, at the higher end. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's not a chance you can f uh, full fuel and full payload. Yeah, uh, so you like go. In, in the 320, 321, you have to pick one or the other. 
Uh, in fact, I've flown a, I used to fly survey and the airplane I flew had extended range tanks and a lot of extra Gucci kit, uh, so like Garmin 950 and stuff. And even with zero payload, you would be overweight with full fuel. Yeah. So you can, I, yeah. you can actually fly overweight, no? Um, y yes, but there's, th there are like certification considerations. You need special permissions and that sort of stuff. It's it, yeah. it's ten it tends to be one off things. A lot of light aircraft when they're delivered from say the Cessna factory or the Piper factory in America to Europe, they'll fit additional fuel tanks in the aircraft, and they'll get an overweight ferry permit. So it's a special authorized flight by the authority uh, to to operate the aircraft overweight, and it's got to be done in consideration with the aircraft manufacturer. Uh, and they'll determine, because a lot of the time for light aircraft, it's a performance issue uh, as opposed to a structural issue. So the aircraft can actually take the weight structurally. It's just, it's going to be performance limited. So there'll be special procedures for the pilot in terms of performance. Uh, but as Tarek said, it's a one-off, you know, it's a it's a case-by-case -case basis. It's a very interesting uh, example. If you go and read it on, or if you go and watch on YouTube, I can't remember who done the video. I think it might have been EOPA or someone like that. But there was a ferry pilot flying across the Atlantic uh, delivering an aircraft. And there was a, an issue with the fuel system on the extended range tank. And the fuel wasn't feeding to the, to the engine from the extended range tank in the cabin. And he spent hours uh, manually blowing into a tube to pressurise the fuel tank to get the fuel to flow into the to the engine, I believe it was a bonanza actually, and wow. uh, he, he spent so long just, especially you know as the tank started to empty of fuel, there was more and more of the tank by volume was air, and he was so puffed out by the time he got to Ireland that he was he was on the verge of passing out, but it's actually the pilot himself telling the story, which is fascinating to fascinating to watch. But anyway, we're diverging. I'll find that for you uh, when we finish, and you can go and watch that. So the payload and the distance to be flown and the fuel required must be carefully considered before the flight to ensure it can be operated in a legal, I've missed that word, a legal and safe manner. Fuel gauges on aircraft are generally very unreliable. A lot of the time they don't even work and are placarded as such. So it's important to know what fuel you've got on board prior to the flight and also know the fuel burn of the aircraft so that you can calculate how much fuel you have aboard. And you'll be amazed at how accurately you can calculate uh, the fuel in the tanks. The gauges are uh, notoriously bad on light aircraft until you get into things like G1000 uh, style setups that use some more advanced uh, measuring equipment in the tanks. I'm going to jump in even then. Uh, remember, um, Andrew, in your G1000s, did you have to set the fuel? Yeah, so it, yes. so it would, uh, so it would measure that. the fuel in the tanks, but it wouldn't put that into the fuel prediction. So you exactly. had to manually set the, the fuel level, and then it would calculate based on fuel flow. Exactly. Uh, yeah. What your remaining fuel was, but uh, yeah, there was a, there was always placards everywhere. It was all over the the, the CBT. This is not actually measured, so yeah, you're right. Even the G1000 has a bit of a tough time. Yeah. So and and those systems where you manually put in the fuel, so the G1000 can manually set how much fuel you have, and then based on an accurate measurement of fuel burn, it'll tell you how much fuel you got in the tank, and that is far more accurate than than like the direct measurement of fuel in the tank. Yeah. They're, they're... Says the one seven two and Piper P twenty eight style fuel gauges as a, a, you know, like a bottle cork on a rod that rotates a potentiometer. It's uh, very very prone to malfunction and misreading. Airliners use a system uh, of three D scanning in the tanks, so they they actually measure the the height of the liquid in the tank at multiple points to build up a matrix. And then the computer takes that and calculates the fuel, and it's very, very accurate. It's to within a few kilograms usually. Uh, 
but that comes at a cost and that cost isn't suitable for light aircraft so we are stuck with fuel gauges that don't work basically that's the long and short of it so who can name some uh fuel quantities that you may use so if anybody's ever seen an operational flight plan if you're flying in VATSIM what components of fuel make up your total fuel I'll give you a hint here's the first one trip that's your A to B what else what what additional components might you need uh, taxi run up Oh, even done it in the right order. Taxi and take off fuel. <laughs> what else? Uh, alternate. alternate. Oh no, you're on fire here. Alternate. So if you get to your, get to where you're going and you can't land, you need to divert. So you need fuel for that. Anything else that you can think of? There's one more thing I think. Well, most two. of the flying clubs I fly have a contingency. Oh, look at this. This Damn. is perfect. Contingency. Normally about five percent of your trip fuel. Although it depends on the operator, they can add more. And there's one more uh, additional or extra fuel that the pilot can choose to add. Or, you know, maybe you're expecting bad weather, maybe you're expecting air traffic control delays, so you can add additional extra fuel. And then the last one that's not pilot dictated, it's legal. Uh, I don't know if it's the same. Hold. Oh, go, sorry. Hold would be under extra fuel, additional fuel. Tarek will give me a row because he told me what one of those it was recently and I can't remember. But hold pilot discretion. It's not a legal requirement. No, you had an idea? Uh, I, at least in the US, there's a, uh, if, you're, if you're at night, you need different, um, a different amount of circling fuel than you would during the day. I don't know if that's what you're talking about. Uh, yeah, that, that's what it's based on. Final reserve. So you need a final reserve of, uh, depending on depending on where you are, depending on what type of flight you're doing. But let's just say you're doing a, a private flight in Europe. You would need 30 minutes by day. Uh, and that's 30 minutes of fuel, I believe, flying at the pattern altitude at cruise speed, I think. Uh, yeah, 1,500 feet. 1,500 feet. Yeah. The other thing is the difference between additional and extra. Additional is a legal requirement based on operational uh, basis. So for those of you who fly VATSIM, think about ETOPS as an example. And then extra is pilot discretion. There you go. Sorry. I knew you'd know. I knew you'd know. You. Back to you, mate. <laughs> there you go. So most of these are down to the pilot, but there is a minimum reserve fuel, and it's a legal requirement. If you land with less than the legal requirement of fuel, it's a reportable incident and you would technically have to uh, raise an air safety report with the operator of the aircraft, which may lead on to an MOR. And then, as we said, it depends where you are, but generally speaking, 30 minutes by day, 45 minutes by night would be your final reserve. So for your typical 172, you burn about 8 gallons of fuel per hour, so you need to land with no less than 4 gallons in the tanks, which is a bottom clenching amount of fuel to find when you land uh, and i'll say that from experience not not a lot doesn't look like a lot and it isn't a lot so you know you really don't want to go there right excellent that's uh that's fuel planning so let's put it all together and see how would we plan a flight so you need a few things to do this uh, don't worry we're going to do it together uh, but if you were to do this on your own, you would need a chart, a sectional, I think you might call it on the other side of the pond. You need a square protractor, you need a scale ruler, you need a flight computer, which uh, looks like this. I think that's a CA, uh, was it a something 6? I was going to say a CX3, but that's a CX3. An E6, mm. I think that is. Might not be. Might just be a it's knockoff that I found on that's Google. Career still. It's an E6B. E6B, there you go. And a CX3, which is the European plastic equivalent. Modern days, we use uh, we use these things, and there's actually uh, an online emulator. Tarek, do you want to go and find that and just stick it in the chat so people can have a look at it? Yeah, I'll do that now. I think if you, if you just Google yeah. CX3 
emulate and I think it comes up as a top link on Google. I, I think I pinned it in one of the resources. So Yeah, it's really good actually. It's a fully working online emulation of the... I've actually got one of these physically, but it, it works exactly the same. And that replaces these old-fashioned slide rule style computers. Uh, you'll also need a plug. This is a very typical plug. Uh, and you'll need a scientific calculator to do a couple of things you can't do. So you need a lot of stuff. So you should find these in any good pilot's flight bag. If they don't have uh, if they don't have any of these things, at least in one shape or form, then a big question if you want to go with them. All of these things can be replaced with an electronic flight planning tool. So in the UK we use a thing called Sky Demon and they've chucked me out of it. So let me just open it again. This is Sky Demon. So this actually does all of these things for us. You can see it calculates everything, including the wind factor. So that's the wind component. So it calculates a heading and it calculates a time based on the wind. So this is a much, much quicker way to do it. This is actually how I do it nowadays. Uh, rather than doing it from the chart, what I'll do is I'll just use this to get all of the information and then I'll put it on the chart and the plug because uh, it's just a, it's, it's a much better, more accurate way to do it. But uh, you certainly can do it the old fashioned way still. Uh, if you, you call want the plug is the pulleys? Is that what they call the plug? The, the pulleys thing's a plug, yeah. So that pilot okay. log, VFR flight log. And it, it Sky Team, and is that kind of like, do you guys have four flight there? In it's the like four flight, yeah, but uh, four flight doesn't have as much coverage on this side of the water. So Sky Demon is the sort of go to, I think, for most Europeans. Uh, four flight's more, I think, it works well for IFR over here, but not VFR, David. Okay, because that's so, what I use. I use four flight. So. Well, if you use four flight, Sky Demon is very, very similar. They do yeah. similar things. Okay, so if you're planning a flight, let's think about the turning points. So what are some good properties of the things that you want to overfly, the things that you're looking for out the window? Do you want them to be small and difficult to see? A road sign? A junction? You know, are those are are an intersection on a road? Are those things going to be good turning points? Do you think? Definitely not a lake. No, no, they are not. Lots of water. Large, okay, awesome dog, birds. Obvious <laughs> targets. Yes, you're given some good examples there. So you got to remember, you're looking at these things from two thousand feet up. You know, you might have some some weather. You might have rain. You might, you know, VFR minima. Uh, is generally speaking about five kilometers forward visibility. You can go even less than that in certain situations, certain classes of airspace. That's not far. It's quite uncomfortable. Uh, it is the absolute minima. You can do it legally, but you know, not always a good idea. But you've got to plan for the fact that you might not have good visibility to be able to see these turning points. Roads are great but you're not driving a car, so don't over rely on them. If it's a highway or a motorway, you can quite often use them. You know, the junctions are usually very big, very obvious, very distinct. They usually have street lighting to make uh, the visibility better for drivers. So you can, you can use certain roads, but don't over rely on them. They're not always very obvious, even if they look like they might be on the chart. The think shapes like towns and woodlands, man-made objects like bridges, wind farms, smokestacks. Navigating in Scotland these days is absolutely delightful because all you have to do is point to a wind farm. They're everywhere. <laughs> and there's another benefit of a wind farm uh, which can help you as a pilot. Can anybody think what that is? This is just a bit of a, a, a stab in the dark here. Is anybody familiar with how wind turbines work? The direction of the way the, the blades will be turned will tell you the direction of the wind. Exactly. The wind turbines swivel and they will uh, 
point into the wind so you can get the wind direction very easily by looking at a wind farm and looking at the wind turbines and seeing which way they're facing. So useful things for pilots. They can be quite difficult because they are, they're adding so many of them so sometimes they're not on the chart yet uh, so you need to be cautious but they're good to you know to place you in a kind of rough area. Someone mentioned lakes earlier or lochs as we call them. Lakes, estuaries, coves, large rivers, all excellent features. Okay, so the point is obvious things, not uh, things that are small when you're in the air that you're not going to be able to recognise very easily. So let's look at this flight from Glasgow to Dundee, um, and we're going to navigate there. So let's look at what we've. Uh, what we've picked and how we've done it and how we've planned the flight. So I'm going to show you how to do it using the CX3. If anyone's interested in the math behind it, by all means, you can uh, you can calculate the components using trigonometry. But the computers do it for you, so you don't have to do that. Uh, we'll look at the isogonals, we'll talk about different ways of marking up the chart and everything else. But did, did everybody get the link to the CX3 first and foremost? A firm. Okay. It's in the it's in the main chat. Uh I did tag here so you should all have gotten a ping for it. Okay, perfect. Sorry, what chat is that, Mario? The chatty area text chatty channel area. in this server. Yes. Chatty area in the server. Okay. So, so you'll Not see. Not the hangout. So, Not so the hangout. Fantastic. This is free and for whole. Yeah. Yeah. The actual calculator is like sixty pounds or something to buy. It's not cheap, but you know, if you were cheeky, you can just use it on the the website because it works really well. Just yeah, okay, right, okay. So we populate this. So this is all just stuff that's related to the, the flight. That's nothing really to do with the uh the planning. We've measured the fuel at thirty thirty gallons at a tank, so we're going to burn eight gallons an hour. Okay, so we put all the stuff in that we know. So we're gonna the wind's one forty at nineteen knots. We got that off the uh the, the weather forecast. We plan to fly at 2,000 feet. Our true airspeed is 110 knots. We got that from the book based on a 2,000 feet cruising altitude and 65% power. So we now want to start doing the first leg. So do you want me to do the first leg and someone else can do the next one? Just so I can show you how to do it. A good idea. Yes, I think so too. Okay. Let's see if I can remember how to use it. Uh, now there's a nice feature in this where you can go to, so it gives you lots of standalone calculation features, but if you go to plan, you can actually do, I think six legs of a flight plan, and it carries through a lot of the variables to the next, next part, okay? So let's put in what we know. So we're gonna do Errol to, Balado, or oh, we're actually going the other way, we're going to Dundee to Glasgow. So what's the distance on the chart? I don't know if you can see this in a high enough resolution. It is a wee bit difficult, but can anybody read the distance? It's the green text. 15 or 16? 15, yep, so it's 15 nautical miles. So we put 15 in, press equals. It goes to a green tick once it's happy. Okay, what's the true course of this leg on the chart? at the top here so 219 if you can't read it okay so we put 219 in here equals oh what's our true airspeed for this leg 110 yep 110 now this always kind of confuses me i always do this in all order probably just because uh i'm a bit thick that's why i'm a pilot but just be careful wind direction and speed in that order 
So what's the wind direction for this flight? Yeah, one four zero. One four zero, and the speed. One nine. Now is that true or magnetic? Sorry, that, I the the so the the wind will be true. Okay. In this instance. Everything the Met Man tells you is true. Yep. There you go. So the the calculator will take into account the the variation and the deviation afterwards. Okay, so what is the variation? That is a very good question, isn't it? Can anybody see the isogonal? It might be hard to see. But if I point it out here, can you see that dashed line? Oh, yep. affirmative, yep. Okay. 2.5 west. Offset. There you go, 2.5 2 west. Now, this is also something that confuses me, and this is where it's good to have that understanding, that... that uh, underlying understanding. So I believe by convention west is negative, uh, generally speaking. But I I have a suspicion this calculator does it the opposite way. So let's try it. Should it be, should be two point five is best, so it's at Yeah. I, I think that might be the case in the calculator, but when we are taught uh in EASA, West by convention is always negative. So it's just it's a bit confusing, but if you if you you can do a check, and the beauty of this calculator is you can very quickly update it if you're wrong. Okay, so that's cal correcting that to minus three rather than uh, minus two point five. Deviation, we we won't bother putting anything in. Okay, fuel burn, we said eight gallons per hour. Okay, and it's then actually asking us what time are you going to depart. So a lot of this is optional. It will start to give you outputs without a lot of this stuff. Uh, but it's always best to put as much in as you know. So let's say we're going to depart at 2200 Zulu. Oh, I didn't like that. I think I didn't use the colon. 2200. There we go. Excellent. Okay, so you can see all of the green ones. It's telling us uh, the, the, the calculated value. So we didn't give it deviation, so it won't give us a compass heading. But we're assuming that there's no or very little deviation, so the compass heading will be the magnetic heading. Okay. If you went back up and then entered zero for the deviation, would it just give you the compass heading then? It, it would indeed, yep. So you can see there, it's now populated. Yeah, so it's, it's okay. the same. So it's telling us here the ground speed's 104.78, compass heading's 207, magnetic heading's 207, true heading's 209. So it's taking into account the variation. And it's telling us the wind correcting angle is minus 10. We're going to burn 1.15 gallons of fuel. It's going to take us 8 minutes and 35 seconds. And if we depart Errol at 2200, we'll arrive overhead Bolado at 8 minutes past. So that's excellent. So let's let's check the... Uh, the correctness of what I've entered into the variation. So for compass to true, we add east and subtract west. For true to compass, we would add west and subtract east. So is this correct? Have I entered it correctly? What do you think, Noel? I think you have. You think so? Yep. So compass to true, Give add it. east, subtract west. True to compass, we add west. So 209 is the true heading. If we're to add west, which is oh. 3. Yep, sorry, I was reading it backwards. Yep, we, we need to flip it. It's Right, okay, so there yeah. you go. So that just goes to show why it's important to have the fundamental understanding, because you, you if at face value... You might take that as correct. So in this calculator, west is positive and east is negative. But if you're taught to fly in Yasa, uh, you might get told the other way around as, as the convention. So it's always good to be aware of that. So what we can do with that is we can transpose it, all of that good information, into our plug, and that's what we fly with. Okay. 
And then it's a case of rinse and repeat. Now, the good thing about this calculator is uh, now that we've done leg one, if we go to leg two, it's actually pulling through the information that we've already input into it. And all we have to do is change the ones that are different. Okay. Did anybody follow me through and put in the info into the calculator? Did they mm, try no. it while I was doing it? I just sent her in the second leg. Okay. Do you want to have a go then at calculating the second leg? I'll I'll quickly do it off screen just so I can double check with you. In terms of the convention west being negative and positive, that's to do with uh, which side of the Greenwich line we are. So in for for the North Americans who are to the west, west is positive, but for us we're to the east it's it's negative. Strange, right, okay. But that's how it yeah. is. Yeah. Always boggled my tiny mind. Never made sense to me. I always thought it was west being bigger and east being smaller, but at the end of the day it's a convention and that's why CDMVT is so good because if you draw it out and and you draw the arrow and the arrow always points to the bigger number, then you can quite easily uh you know, visualize it so it's never an issue. That's why it's always good to try and do these things, you know, graphically rather than trying to do it mathematically. So has anybody managed to come up with leg number two? What's our uh, heading and our distance? Two for eight, I'm reading, and um, the miles. Two for eight. So two forty is the course. That's the that's the true course. And distance is one seven. Yep. So distance is one seven. So I think we could put that in there. I think what I've actually done here is I've. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Oh so, yeah. Yeah. This, this is high. The, the, the oh. safe altitude, by the way, is based on the chart. Uh, it's just it's an altitude you use if you get into IMC and shrimp meteorological conditions. You would you would as a first port of call, climb to the safe altitude uh, and then turn around to try and get out of the IMC without hopefully hitting anything. Uh, so we've just added that in. So the only thing that we are calculating on the plug is the heading and the ground speed. Okay, the, the, everything else is measured from the chart or from the Metman. So we work through this one together, just speed things along here. So the blue ones are, the blue ones of what is what's pulled through from the first leg, okay? So most of the information is the same. The only thing that's different is the distance and the course, okay? So 17, 17 nautical miles is the distance and the true course is two, 240, excuse me. So if I enter them, the rest of them remain the same because the wind's not changed, the trigger speed's the same, the variation's the same. It's already calculated the departure time based on the arrival time of the previous leg. You can see here it gives us a ground speed of 114 and a magnetic heading of 242. And again, let's do a gross error check. So where's the wind coming from? It's coming from the southeast, isn't it? Blowing up from Edinburgh up that way. So if you were to think about what we said all the way back at the start, which way do you want to turn to compensate for the wind? Do you want to turn into the wind, don't you? Mm -hmm. So 242 would be turning into the wind by six degrees. So that, it sounds right. And you should always do this when you're planning and you're flying. You know, do a gross error check. If your calculation's telling you to turn with the wind, there's something not right about that. You've maybe done something wrong. Okay. So again, we can put those bits of information into here. So 239 was the heading. Slightly different, but you know, however I've calculated it here, it's, it's, it's coming out of a slightly different number. And the time is nine minutes. 
from Balado to Sterling. Okay. Does that make sense? Could you see what we're doing here? Yes. Do we need, do we need to do the third one? Does anybody want to try it? Are we, are we quite content of how this works? Well, let's just do the third one. It's a yeah. bit more involved when you've got a, a, a mechanical calculator like an E6 uh, or a, a Pui's uh, CX, whatever it is. But CRP5. CRP5, that's the one. Yeah, it's a bit more involved, but the principle's the same. It's just I... a slide rule. I still can't Is believe the... you got you got to choose the electronic one. I know it's great. I'm still, still, <laughs> I'm, I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> I also got to take the full JEP into every exam. So for the air law exam, I was able to just look up the legal definitions of everything. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, okay. Leg three. Has MD got? Has MD run ahead and calculated it, or do I do it together? I think I got it. I just want to make sure the green number is one eight. Correct. Uh, in fact, no, sorry, it's 1 6. It's 1 6. Oh, it's 1 there, 6. Okay. It's up here in the distance column. Uh, oh, I see. Okay. Then uh, then give me one second. <laughs> Making some modifications. Yeah. Uh, all right. So if it's the distance is 1 6 and the true course is 1 9 9 -er, um, then your ground speed ends up being uh, 9 or 9 or your. True heading ends up being one nine or zero, and your magnetic heading and compass heading is one nine or three. You're within a degree of what I got, so I, I concur. And how long is it going to take? Uh, Fly the leg. Ten minutes, not nine or minutes and forty three, forty one seconds. So we always round up. So ten, ten minutes we'd call ten it. Minutes. Okay, excellent. That's that's it. That's how you. So there's a whole lot of information on here. And in the aircraft, all you're really looking at is the heading and the time. And what you would do is, once you're overhead, you'd start the timer, or you'd, sorry, you'd turn on to the, the, the heading, you'd start the timer, and you'd write down, you know, the current time plus nine minutes as your ETA. And then you would uh, put the, the chart down and focus on steering the heading, and you wouldn't look at the chart until you had a checkpoint. Okay. So the, the, the modern instruments make it very easy to calculate these things, okay? In real life, it's uh, it's actually a very satisfying thing. This is a picture from one of the flights that I'd done in Scotland. I flew west from Glasgow, flew north up to Oban, and then up the Great Glen, all the way up over Loch Ness, up to Inverness, which is the, the, the town at the top of Inverness. This was part of my CPL qualifier um, where I'd done Glasgow to Inverness, Inverness to Dundee and then Dundee back to Glasgow and it was something like 350 miles or something. It was a really good flight. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I'd done it all by dead reckoning just uh, to prove a point I suppose because a lot of people don't do it anymore. So, they all rely on GPSs these days, I think. Yeah, a GPS is great, but you know, it's always good to back up your position with uh, some some dead reckoning to try and yeah, get yourself. You know, to find out of it. And it's also a good bit of fun as well. It's uh, there's actually a competition run called Top Nav where you've got to so you get a pilot and navigator team. And you you have to fly. They put a GPS tracker in the aircraft, but you have to fly using dead reckoning, and you get points for your accuracy, uh, both in position and time. So it's quite quite a cool competition. I've always wanted to do it, although it's down in the south of England, so I've never been able to. But quite a, an expensive venture. So how do we how do we read the chart? How do we do use this in flight? So on approach to the turning point, you would look at the chart. You look at what you're expecting to see, and you familiarise yourself with the features that you expect along the way. Okay. You turn on to the heading, you start the timer, and then you fill out the actual, or sorry, the actual time of arrival over your current point and your estimated time of arrival over the next point. Then you fly the heading. 
and then you compare the features you can see out the window with what you expected to see but you don't start to fly the chart okay and by that i mean you're not looking out the window looking for a feature looking at the chart and then adjusting your heading based on what you can see and what you, where you think you are that's called feature crawling and it doesn't demonstrate dead reckoning can i um quickly jump in andrew because i want to do yeah. a fun little exercise can anybody here tell us where on the chart this picture has been taken just based on the information you can see on the screen yes all right I go, can. On. go on uh if you take a look at the chart you know it's from the left part the f i think it's the turning point um where you go up to the lock nest lock nest sorry so it's that turning point with that small island i think uh and andrew could you track it with your with your pointer and mario you can tell him to stop uh there you think it's here yeah. is that correct andrew it's actually we were flying the reciprocal on this leg so i believe it's down here i think it might be at this island here because you could see the long sort of island mm. and then the small island it was on a different oh yeah flight. it didn't it didn't follow the river yeah properly, so yeah. a bit of a, a trick question from Tarek there but we are actually in in this area i believe down here and we're flying the opposite direction, so the land's on the left. Oh, hello, Sky Demon. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting, even from that bloody partial picture, you can actually still get a, a, a feel for where you are. Scotland's great for nav that way because there is a lot of obvious features. That's a really fun question to ask. It's a really, yeah. really, I love this picture, Andrew. I absolutely love it. <laughs> that is good, isn't it? Actually, the reason I took this picture is because I, I used to work in the shipyard and uh, the guys on the shop floor were complaining that A A not drawings and A one drawings were too big and they couldn't they couldn't take them down to the ship. And I took this picture to say, well, if I can get an A not chart in a light aircraft cockpit and open it and use it, you can take a drawing down on a ship without a doubt. <laughs> so it was a bit tongue in cheek. This picture it wasn't actually intended for aviation, but there you go. Um. So the important point is, if you are off course, use features you can see to estimate your position and make a calculated correction. Do not guess. Uh, you have to accurately place yourself on the chart, measure where you are against where you should be, and then calculate how to fix that. Okay? And we'll look at some ways to do that. Positively identify the next turning point by looking for things, obvious features, uh, that would disprove your position if they weren't on the chart. And read from the ground back onto the chart, not the other way about. So, you know, for example, if I was trying to place myself here, I would look out of the window, I'd look at this island, a small island next to a bigger island and a large body of water. I'd then look at for those on the chart. And it, you know, you always know roughly where you are. So I know I'm down here. So I would start to look for those things, okay, there's there's something that looks like it. What else would give it away? Well, there's a bit of land, there's a peninsula just beyond the island. Okay, that looks like a bit of land there uh, with some water going inland. And uh, yeah, I think that that was the case you deviate because of the weather. Then how did you compensate for that on time or? Did you count you... minutes that you go off track into something into a certain heading and then you just compensate it back or so if you go off track we're going to look at how you would fix that in the last sort of 10 minutes or so uh, there's some really good ways to do it actually uh, i had some slides in here but i'm actually going to go and take scally draw because it's a bit easier to to do it that way because there's some cool ways you can do it so the correct track error correction uh, is fixing an error no matter how good you plan the met man's not always a hundred percent right sometimes there's unexpected wins sometimes you're just not that great at holding a heading uh, sometimes you're not that great at holding an altitude so you climb and descend a bit and you slow down and you speed up uh, so you, you'll always have some deviation generally speaking so winds give a different 
errors in pre-flight calculations, errors in setting and maintaining headings. The actual track of the aircraft is called the track made good. Uh, the difference between the flight plan track and the track made good is the track error. And calculating the, the track error is the first part of correcting course for most methods. If you calculate the track error only and then correct your heading by the track error, uh, you will fly parallel to the, to the flight path uh, track, I'm sorry, the flight planned track. So there's another angle you've got to calculate, which is the closing angle to get you back on track. And I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate what I mean by that. There's loads of ways to do this. You can use the 1 in 60 rule. You can use the standard closing angle. Or you can use the inverse ratio rule, which has become my favorite rule. Um, and I almost exclusively use that now. Might be interesting, because the last time we ran this, uh, when Null was here, I had a preference for doing a more calculated, heavy way, uh, but the, the inverse ratio rule is fantastic. It was a an excellent, well-seasoned instructor that, that showed me this when I was doing my commercial pilot's license, and it's really, really stuck with me, and I think I'll teach it to everyone who cares to ask me in future, and maybe even those who don't. So the 1 in 60 rule is the foundation of everything. We'll cover the principle of it and then we'll look at the application. So for every 60 miles travelled, one mile off track is equal to one degree uh, of track error, that should say. Okay, so I've visualised that here. So if you steer an incorrect heading, which is off by one degree, if you fly 60 miles, by the end of it, you'll be one mile off course. Okay, so that could be your steering error, that could be the wind that blows you off course, but the principle holds true regardless. So let's take an example. You are 10 miles into a, a 30 mile leg, and you measure, you, you look out the window, you've got a checkpoint, you look out the window, and you're 2 miles off course. So watch your track error, and then watch your closing angle. Can MD give it a bash? Does MD have a... Does MD feel brave and wants to try and calculate that? Yeah, give me a sec. <laughs> don't, don't use a calculator, by the way. You've got to do this in your head. <laughs> no, you can't, me. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. It's very simple. Okay, so the total corrections of track error plus the closing angle. So... The track error you calculate as the uh, distance gone into 60 multiplied by the, the distance off course. So we're 10 miles in at this point. So how many times does 10 go into 60? Six. 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 Easy. Right. And we're two miles off course. So what's six times two? Eight. 12 degrees off then. 12. Yep. So that's the track error. So if we turn right by 12 degrees, we'll parallel. So we'll stop the error, we'll stop the drift, but we'll now fly parallel to our uh, planned track. And if Null Town is down here, we're not going to get there. So we've got to do an additional step. Okay, there you go. So there's the 12 degrees. So we've got to calculate. We've got to get from this point where we are to the point we wanted to get to. So we use the exact same steps, but this time it's based on the distance to go. So how many miles do we have remaining of the leg? We're 10 miles in when we've started this process of a 30 mile leg. So how many miles have we got to fly? 20. One. Okay, cool. So who wants to take it from there? What would be the next step? Uh, we need to correct another 12 degrees. If you correct another 12 degrees, you'll, oh, no, yeah. you'll come in somewhere here. Yeah, 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 that's true. Do you need to divide it you're only by a third the, of the remaining way in. distance, you know, the other distance? Yep, so 20, what do you do with the 20? What did we do? What did we do with the, the first step? We, we took 60, 60 into, or into 10 into 20. 60, sorry. So 
Yeah, you need to divide like yeah, the same. It's the same formula. Yep. And you need okay. to add uh, those two miles that you went of course, maybe. So that's it. So how many times is twenty going to sixty? Yeah, the six. Three, Three times. How many miles are we off course? Uh, that part's not changed. Two. We're still two miles off course. So three times two is six. So that means <coughs> that this closing angle would now need to be six. So all in, we need to correct the heading by 18 degrees at this point. If we turn right 18 degrees, we should get to Null Town. What a place. Nice. What a place. Now, if you do that enough, you can get quite good at it and you can actually do it in your head uh, in the aircraft. And I have done it. I've used that quite a lot. Uh, it's very useful, but that that is the fundamental basis of virtually every method of correcting in the aircraft. Oh, we can put animations in it. Oh, look, we're in the wrong place. We turn <laughs> right. We get to where we're going. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, right, okay, so I'm going to go into Excalidraw because I don't like this one anymore, actually. Change my mind. I, 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 we'll discuss this one, then we'll go into Excalidraw. So, standard closing angle is a different way to do it. Uh, it depends on your speed, um, what the closing angle needs to be, but the principle of this is you measure how far off course you are, and then you turn towards your course by a fixed amount and you fly that for a period of time determined by how far off course you are okay so here's the figures so for a true airspeed whether you want to do a one minute or a two minute closing angle uh, the, the angles change depending on your airspeed. So the faster you go, the smaller the angles become. Okay. So after you perform the correction, you turn back onto the heading, but you need to correct for wind. So it's a wee bit. I don't really like this method because it, it requires. There's a, there's a certain particular application for it that will show you, but it it really for me requires more thinking than some of the other of the other methods. Okay, so let's look at an example. So we're 15 miles into a 40 mile leg and we're th we find that we're three miles off course. What speed are we doing? 110. Okay, so first of all, if we want to use a one minute closing angle, what would be, for 110 knots, what would the angle be? What would be the closing angle we would need based on the table? By the way, I keep this table with me in the aircraft. Hmm. I don't 33? remember these numbers. Yes, correct. So if we turn right by 33 degrees and we're three miles off course, so if we fly that heading for three minutes, we'll come back. After three minutes, we will be on the original track is the thinking behind it. If we turn back onto the original heading that we were flying to put us in this position, what would happen? Hmm. No, I didn't like it. Would I follow the track nicely, hunky dory, get to Null Town? Or was there something wrong with my calculation in the first place and that's how I ended up three miles off? And would I end up away back over here, do you think? If you're flying in a straight line or in a straight leg, I think that is more efficient the other way. But what's even, going to happen? Even though you so, travel a little bit more. So we ended up three miles off course after 15 miles flying the leg, flying the heading. So yeah, do you need to apply the correction before the yeah the correct. correction angle? That that's exactly yeah. what I was looking at. So you have to calculate the correction, and to do that, you would have to apply the one in six rule again. So let's try that. Someone want to do it for me? What would be the track? error that got us in this position that's 15 degrees so it's 15 miles into 60 oh. so it's 15 into 60 four four oh sorry yeah four. okay what's four oh, times it's three it's 12. 60. 12 yep so when we get after three minutes we need to turn on to whatever heading we were flying but 
uh, plus 12 degrees because the wind must be coming from the south, so it's blowing us to the north, of course. So we have to correct the heading by 12 degrees to prevent us, because if we don't, if we if we do the closing angle, we get back on track, and then we after the three minutes we turn back onto the original heading, we're going to be subject to the same error. We're going to end up up here again. So we have to correct for we have to address the cause of the the error. Okay. As well as getting back on course, and this is why I don't like this rule because it's a bit. I don't know, it's just a bit weird. It has a use, and I'll show you that shortly. Okay, but basically we would fly 45 degrees corrected for three minutes. And then after three minutes, we would go back on the track error corrected. Uh, sorry, we would go back on to the original heading corrected by the track error. Oh, okay, so you yeah. just apply to that turning point, uh, to the yeah. turning correcting angle yet. Yep, so maybe this animation will actually serve a purpose this time and, and explain it better than my words. So you can see here, we've turned onto the heading, but the wind blows us off course. We've just realised, oh shoot, we're not on course. What's that thing, that closing angle thing? Let me look at my kneeboard. Okay, right, so I'm 110 knots, I need a 33 degree closing angle. What's my track error? Uh, hold on, let me completely forget everything I've ever learned and spend two minutes just staring <laughs> out the window. Uh, 12, right, okay, it's 12. So I need to turn right by 45 degrees and I need to start my watch and time it for three minutes. Right, that's three minutes up. What was it Tarek told me that I really wasn't listening to in the last lesson before he sent me solo? Oh, I really wish I, I listened to Tarek. He's usually full of sense and good stories. Oh yeah, that's right. I've got to turn on the original heading, but I've got to correct it by the track error, so the 12 degrees. See how I'm not quite on the original heading? I've ca I've corrected to compensate for the wind that blew me off course in the first place. And now, I'll get to null town. Fly back at 33, don't you? And then correct at 12 to get back on course. Yes, correct. You don't fly 45 from the off. No, no, you're, you're only doing the 45 for three minutes to get you back on the flight path that you plotted, and then you are continuing by the original head and corrected by 12 degrees to prevent you getting blown off course again. So can anybody think of why this might be a good correction method? If you have terrain that you can't go, yeah. That's a mountain, not a pancake, by the way. <laughs> Just in case anybody's getting hungry. <laughs> yes, primary reason I would use this would be terrain, weather, or airspace. Okay. Andrew, could I ask a, a question real quick? Yeah. yeah. So if, if I was doing this with a 1 in 60 rule and that mountain wasn't there, would it be 1, 9, or decimal 2? Uh, would what be 1, 9, decimal 2? the correction angle to get to null town with this issue i was just i was just trying to practice while we were doing oh yeah okay so if it was so if you were to do the rest of the corrections so your 40 minus 15 would be uh 25 wouldn't it so yeah let's just call that three times into 60 three threes is nine so 12 and nine would be two so it'd be 21 that so around about 20 degrees yeah Okay, yeah, I got it. I got two two decimal four times three equals seven decimal two, and then twelve plus seven decimal two is nineteen decimal two, which I guess would be rounded up to twenty. Yeah, so okay. about twenty degrees. You, you, the the scale on a on a heading indicator is usually every five degrees, so you can only actually fly it to half half the division. So your accuracy in the aircraft is plus or minus point uh, two point five degrees. Gotcha. So but... it's not it's not worth being overly accurate if you're doing it in your head it's much easier to just call 25 20 or 30 because they go into yeah. 60 much more easily um so yeah you know if you if you can do that if, if you can calculate 25 into 60 in your head very quickly then crack on you know it's always better to be more accurate but for for the purpose of this it's easier for most people just to to approximate it'll get you roughly the same answer um, I'm going to come back to this because I want to show you the thing that I keep going on about because I just think it's so great. Scaladraw. 
Ah, here's what I made earlier. Great. Let's see. A uh, we're flying from Drummond, not Dry Men, to Dumbleen. Can anyone think? I suppose we'll go on to the next slide here, but what would be some good points to use as uh, a checkpoint, a how goes it point, as we call it? Towns. Yeah. Look at this town here, Buclivy. So, Buclivy is uh, quite convenient for a number of reasons because it's a third of the way. Uh, which which helps us. So if we mark that and say that's going to be our first how goes at point. So how long is this going to take? Let me just check. Oh, Sky Demon barred me again. Excellent. So that's an 11 minute leg. So that's going to be about three and a half minutes. So normally on my chart, I would I would write that. Okay, three minutes 30. So what I would do is I would get to Drummond, I turn onto my heading. Uh, in fact, let's just copy that heading down. Track, track true, heading, track true. It's a one zero six five. So the track zero six five, n zero eight four. Okay, and that is because the wind is coming from the north, sort of northwest, I think. So it's a given for the wind. I should have drawn this out beforehand. Southwest, 170 and 30. Very nice wind. Okay, so again, I would normally draw that. So that's not right, Andrew. Yeah, it was right. So that's roughly the wind. 170 at 30. Okay, so you can see, and this is why it's always good to draw the wind. It doesn't need to be dead accurate as long as it gives you a rough idea. But what do you think are we experiencing mostly a crosswind or mostly a headwind with that wind? Crosswind. Yeah, yeah, pretty much yeah. a full crosswind, isn't it? So, um, what I was taught and i really like this was it's it's called fan lines okay so you draw a line about 10 degrees off the track okay you normally make it something obvious like a, a green color or something like that quite heavy so you can see it now what the fan line does is it actually allows you to visualize the track error without measuring it so this is a really, really good way to visualize and correct quickly. Now I'm going to pull out my kneeboard because I've got this written down. And by the way, I write a lot of this stuff down and take it with me that way because it's much easier. So there's standard values you can apply depending on whereabouts you are. So let's say we're flying along. I'm going to draw a little airplane here. Derek, you can slag my Excalidraw skills all you want. I've been there, done that, and I'm still doing it, so. Try my best. It's shift, isn't it? Shift click. Group. Group. Yeah, see, that's not bad. Okay, so we're flying along. And I'm just looking at my chart, and we get to about here, and I go, right, that's us just coming up on the how goes it point. So we're three minutes, three minutes 15, and I have a look out the window, and I go, what's that town down there? Oh, I think I'm at Buclivy. And then I look at my chart. So where should Buclivy be relative to the aircraft if I flew this leg correctly? Should it be to the left of the aircraft, to the right of the aircraft, or should we be above it? It should be on the left, yeah. 
Okay, that's right. But it's not on the left. We're right over the top of it. So we are we're to good. the left of track, aren't we? We're good. We're to the left of track, yes. Yes. So if we know the fan line is ten degrees and we can you know, we can estimate that. Uh, so you would you would measure that you would draw the fan line so you know that it's, it's a ten degree fan line. I always use ten degrees because it's dead easy. But what I'll actually do is you can visualize it. So if you were to in your head project the fan line onto this side, how far off course in degrees do you think we are? You know, so are we halfway between the, the track and the fan line? Are we on the fan line? Are we closer to the track than the fan line? Are we closer to the fan line than the track? Are we on the other side of the fan line? What do you think? Pretty close to it, but <clears throat> so somewhere I'd say between 5 and 10 degrees. Yeah, that's it. So that's how powerful the fan line is because we can look at that and estimate that your track error is about 5 degrees, I would say. Now, hmm. this, is the, this is where we apply the inverse ratio rule. So where is Buclivy along the, 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 the leg? Is it halfway? Is it about a third? Is it a quarter? Is it some third. other obscure? I'd say it's about a third. So with the 1 in 60 rule, some clever person's calculated that if you're a third of the way along the track, all you have to do is multiply your track error by 1.5, and that will be your total correction. So we've used the fan line to very, very quickly visualize that we're five degrees off course. So we could just do five times one and a half. So that would be seven and a half. Let's call it eight. We correct by eight degrees. There's a wee correction there. And we'll get to Dumblain. And I've used this in practice and it's great because you don't have to pull rulers out. You don't have to do much mental arithmetic. All you have to do is be conscientious with your uh, picking your turn, or sorry, your, your how goes it points, your checkpoints. And then when you get to that point and you look, you can determine your position. You can visualize where you are. You can visualize the track error without doing the 1 in 60 rule. And then all you do is multiply that uh, track error by a standard multiplier and you've got your overall correction. So that's much quicker and much more convenient to do in the aircraft. Does that make sense? Do you get that, that process? Do you get the purpose of the fan line? Yes. Or is it still a bit confusing? No, it, it, it tracks. Yeah? Oh. <laughs> but Derek? Perfect. I think I was growing about this tea after my training. This is this is my fav my favorite method, as you well know. <laughs> yeah, no, I love it. Hey, so mark and key features. There's different ways to do it. I've just showed you one of them. If you mark key features in the map, it makes it easier to calculate your position much more quickly. Okay, allows you to determine track errors at predetermined distances through the leg. If you use a six-minute mark. You don't need to measure the distance because you could say it, a, a six minute mark is always one tenth of the ground speed. So as an example, if you're flying along at 100 knots, every six minutes you'll cover 10 miles because it's just a 10. So six minute marks, I think, is an RAF technique. Um, likes of here, if we are flying along at about 100 knots ground speed, Without measuring, I know that that six minute mark should be about 10 miles into the leg. Okay, which is about two thirds, which looks looks roughly correct, just based on the visualization, yeah? So something I've used, it's all situational. I, I use different techniques. There's not one size fits all. It's what works best in your head and also what works best for the given situation. Halfway and quarter points allow you to use the inverse ratio. Third points as well, which is what we're just showing you on Excalidraw. Um, the best practice to mark both the distance and the ETA over a feature to minimize cockpit calculations. Okay, so give yourself as much info on the ground as you can. Uh, and as I've alluded to, 
I'm not superhuman. I'm not actually very good at mental arithmetic. I've created my own uh, cheat sheet, which I keep in my knee board. So when I'm flying along, if I want to do the one in 60 route, rather than doing it in my head, the way we've just shown you guys, I use this table. So it, it gives you the answers. Here's the standard closing angle. This has actually changed because uh, this this wasn't actually really correct. This one I don't like. So the way it's written now, I've I've updated my knee board. Uh, but I've also got the inverse ratio multipliers on there. That's us. You'll be glad to hear. Any questions that you haven't already asked? No, you pretty much covered many things that I wanted to know. Good, I'm glad. Hopefully he's, uh, he's learned something. I'd like to see you go try it in the sim, because it works in the sim. Uh, so it's, you know, it's good fun, it's quite satisfying. Null, I think you can attest to that. You've been doing a wee bit since the last session. Yeah, this is this is super good in the sim. It, it's like, the first time it, I, I pulled it off, it you look down, you're like, oh, there's that bridge I was planning on seeing. This is incredible. And you feel... <laughs> yeah, kind of it's amazing. just fantastic, yeah. Also, also, yeah, I started, like, flying with no track, like, three months ago, or not looking at Navigraph or any app, you know. Also, for, IF, for IFRs, you know, I plan non-enough routes, yeah. Just in all the VORs, it's kind of fun. Also, be a far point to point with the timer and the compass. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, but, it's really satisfying. It is, it's good fun. Yeah, but the sector of charts for Europe are just pretty expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they can be. Uh, can be. Yeah. That was amazing, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, no worries at all. If anyone Seriously, has any thank questions. you so much. If you guys have any questions, you can ask them here now, or if you come up with them later, you can ask them in the chatty area, and we, and then one of us will respond. It's me, it's Andrew, myself, and and one of one other pilot who's an Airbus pilot. Uh, so you feel free to ask questions whenever you want. Now, uh, this is sort of like a bit of marketing for ANC, but there is zero, like we don't, we don't expect people to ever use our services we we like community which is why like we've spent so much time in the aviate community for example um uh but yeah but this is this is just an awareness that we we teach professionally and this is just a taster of the sort of thing we teach um but thank you again we really appreciate you coming and thank you to andrew i'm always impressed with this with this lecture because i don't think i could teach navigation as well as this uh, it's it's uh, in my opinion it's one of the best uh, aviation lectures you can you can do or seminar or lesson yeah. or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah, it covers much everything you know all the basics, all the descriptions of those basics, and yeah, it gets deeper and deeper. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, that calculator is fantastic. Oh yeah, that's brilliant. And actually, I've got the real one, but the uh, I can attest that the the web version works just as well. I've actually scraped the web version to save it locally on my computer because it's so good. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, guys, thank you very much for putting this up, you know, for, yeah, for no putting this together. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed that a lot. And yeah. Loved good. It. Glad you guys enjoyed it.